Welcome to Fintech Daydreaming, the podcast that dives into the world of banking technologies and the ever-changing landscape of fintech companies. We bring you real-life examples from global and local thought leaders, as well as experts working within the financial industry, and seek out the best stories from the front lines of financial services innovation, where dreams of industry pioneers meet reality. Hosted by Paul Krogdahl and Ville Sontu, this is Fintech Daydreaming. Hello and welcome back to another exciting installment of your favorite fintech and banking technology podcast, Fintech Daydreaming. I'm Paul Krogdahl, your host for this episode, and with me, as always, is my fantastic friend and co-host, Villa Sointo. Now, this show would not be complete without our traditional opening segment joke. So without any further delay or ado, over to you, my fantastic friend, and this episode's listener joke. Hi, Paul. And do I really have a bad one, an old one uh, for you this time? But uh, we have to go with it because it's from our dear listeners and we love them all uh, in their own way. So uh, did you hear the one uh, about that old bankers uh, never die? No, I have not. Yeah, they just lose interest. Oh, my. <laughs> oy, oy. <laughs> and uh, that uh, wonderful joke was courtesy of Timo Hotti from Finland, a uh, good friend of mine as well, a uh, friend of the show. Thank you for that. Looking forward to even more uh, the, uh, the jokes like this uh, about fintech and banking. Absolutely. Thank you very much, Timo. That's a fantastically good joke. But today we have got another fantastic guest with us here in the virtual fintech daydreaming studio and continuing the extremely fantastic high streak of high profile banking superstars sharing their insights and thoughts with us uh, on the ongoing transformation and disruption in the banking industry. With us today, we have got none other than Jim Morose, uh, who has been named as one of the most influential people in banking today and one of the top five fintech influencers to to follow so if you're a fintech i really really recommend that you you go and start following jim on on linkedin twitter and even on instagram i can tell you he's got a great instagram uh, uh, account that's worth following he is an internationally recognized financial industry strategist a co-publisher of the financial brand owner and publisher of the Digital Banking Report and the host of another fantastic podcast called Banking Transformed. He's also a fantastic speaker that you can check out on, on YouTube and other places and has been featured by the likes of CNN, the Wall Street Journal, New York Times and many, many other uh, news agencies and channels. But you know, why am I telling you all of this when we can get the full story from our guest himself. So welcome to the show, Jim. We're absolutely delighted to have you with us on, on our show. Uh, and maybe for the very few people out there who do not know who you are, uh, what's your background, Jim? And how did you get to where you are today? Well, you know, I have to admit that the, the position of the joke about old bankers and dying, um, I, I'm, I'm going to try not to take that personally, but, uh, and, and hopefully that uh, the listeners will not lose interest in today's show that I'm on, but uh, really appreciate being here, Paul. And, and you know, as my, far as my background goes, it, not many people, I don't know if they really know the whole background, but basically out of university, I started working for a major bank in, in Cleveland, Ohio, which is where I live and live today. And worked for that organization in the management training program and in the marketing area for about five years. I then went to a smaller financial institution, became a, a bigger fish in a smaller pond. It was a blast. It was in marketing area again, and proceeded to move to a, um, a, large, organization, a large banking organization. It was a combination of three bad savings and loans back in the days in, in the early, oh, geez, early eight, 1980s, I guess, that uh, they used to combine bad organizations, think they make good organizations. And, and this one didn't work any better than the other ones did. But I was in banking for basically overall uh, roughly 15 years before I got into the other side of the business. I started, I joined a uh, direct and digital market, well, basically, basically just direct mail agency 
where we served only financial institutions. So basically I took the other side of the desk, worked with marketers, people I knew, people I had been in the past and did that type of work for about another 15 years. So I, I was in the direct and, and eventually direct and digital marketing agency world for a while, even had a spell up in Canada where I worked uh, three days a week for five years on behalf of a major Canadian financial institution. But again, all financial services work. And then I started writing as, as part of my career and, and, and wrote to get in the doors of financial institutions that I wanted to serve and thought that if I wrote about subject matter, they get to understand more about my perspective. I could refer to it in this way. And in fact, uh, the writing of articles about consultant reports that people didn't even know were out there helped out a lot because they say, well, I'll, I can bring in this report for you, which just was kind of a, just a, a sales tactic, but it's something that grew and grew. And, and we talked about it before the show that sometimes you have to keep the frequency and the cadence going because you don't even know that people expect it. And, and I took a summer off to follow my son's uh, lacrosse career in, in, in college level and, and said, you know, I can always travel and do the same thing. But I, I decided to take the summer off. Well, during that summer, people thought I had possibly died and uh, realized that, okay, you got to keep the things going if you get them going. And join the financial brand. Gosh, I, it's got to be around eight years right now where he, Jeffrey Pilcher, the owner of the, the financial brand, liked what I was writing about, liking the fact that we were almost yin and yang. He talked about small organizations and marketing. I talked about big organizations, marketing, digital transformation, everything that was going on in the marketplace. And it's been a great partnership ever since. And since then, you know, bought a uh, report business from um, the person who started Finovate. And, um, and, Really, I've had a lot of fun with that. And the most recent addition to what I'm doing is the podcast, which, as we discussed, is is something in and of itself, a, an extraordinary educational experience, at least for me, and hopefully for our listeners. Yeah, abs- absolutely. I, th- I think, you know, doing the podcast, like you said, it's it's a win-win. It's, it gives us, as the host, the ability to, to bring some fantastic people onto the show like yourself. But we learn something through every single episode that, that we record, and, and it gives value to, uh, to our listeners as well. So I agree with that, absolutely. Now, now Jim, you, you actually spend a lot of time writing and talking about uh, current digital disruption within the banking industry and, and have demonstrated your fantastically deep insights into what is currently a perfect storm for transformation, I would say. Now, in relation to this, how do you see the threat from big tech companies evolving going forwards with the the change in administration in the US, as a good example, uh, the recent regulatory reviews into Ant Financial? I mean, what is the future for companies like Google and WhatsApp in the financial industry? Well, be it the firms in China or the ones in the UK or, or any place in Europe and, and, and the US and, and actually globally, I think what we have is we have a lot of competition from all players. You know, and, and I have some great examples of very small players that are doing really fantastic things. We have big financial institutions that are building digital units, such as Emirates, NBD, and, and a number of other firms that have, have built these separate units to serve c- consumers and small businesses. But I think what we're seeing more than ever is that number one, you don't have to be a bank to get into banking. And I think the difference between Alibaba or a Tencent is that those are actually digital banking organizations that, have ex- that expanded beyond the realm in an open banking type environment. But I think when we, when we look at what the the big tech organizations are doing in the US and the UK, they're going to touch the, the limits of what you can do in banking without becoming banks. They're going to use affiliates. They're going to provide services. And I think, you know, when you, when you look at the biggest threat, the biggest threat is not about the organizations, except that the way they use data and analytics to understand the consumer to drive the next best product and be it financial or in Amazon's case, being a retail product. And I think we have a lot of, I mean, if somebody steps back and looks at what's out there today and what the possibilities are, let's say the Google situation where they're partnering with financial institutions, Citibank, and then a number of other smaller firms. Well, Citibank's interesting because Citibank isn't going to really lose any consumer business from what they're doing with Google because they're not, it's not a big, huge part of their business. 
but they could expand tremendously. If you start to use the Google Analytics engine and you start driving what people look at, what they're buying, what they're doing, and you put that towards financial services, Citibank is building a really good product set saying, we don't mind Google having the front door to this relationship because basically it's something we would not be able to build necessarily the same way. Now, on the other hand, those organizations that are partnering with Google to jump the shark, so to speak, and, and, and build a better customer engagement, I get a little concerned because I go, geez, are, are you making a deal with the devil there? Because how do you get out of that engagement? I mean, Google's a great organization and that's part of the, the fear from my standpoint. But if you're a really small organization, you want to grow quickly. Maybe Google is the answer. It's just that I think it limits your options. Plus, it's it. I'm not going to call it lazy because that's not necessarily the truth. But I think you could do almost anything that Google is doing through multiple partnerships and building better digital services. And and so, you know, the the biggest threat right now. And, and this was said by the chairman of Lemonade when I interviewed him on the podcast, and I still quote him often saying, the biggest barrier to digital banking transformation is legacy leadership and culture. That getting unstuck, you know, because most banking leaders today have been in their firm or in the banking industry 30 or 40 years. They're surrounded by others that have been in the traditional banking space for 30 or 40 years. And what ends up happening from that is that when you've been in the business for so long, it's really hard to unlearn what you've done. In fact, we're still putting trainees through rotation to, so that they can learn how we do things. Jeez, what a, what a deal killer. You know what? What a way to take the enthusiasm out of a person that just graduated from university and say, okay, we're gonna, everything you've learned, we're going to teach you how we do it. And the person's got to be shaking their head going, this is not the way of the future. Uh, I want to circle back a little bit what you said about Google there. Uh, I, mean, I still remember like 10 years ago when Google Wallet launched for the first time. Uh, and the questions from the banks were mostly related to the fact that, well, now Google is coming after our data. So and they're coming after the transaction data and they're going to take over. Uh, and maybe that's part of the reason why Google Wallet's first attempt kind of uh, fizzled out in the beginning. Uh, might need might be something else, but still that was part of the narrative between the banks and, and Google. Uh, do you feel that this has somehow changed now? Because uh, Google seems to be getting more involved uh, with Google Pay and getting traction, of course, through the Android phones. Do you think the attitudes of banks have changed uh, towards Google and big techs in general? I, I think the majority of banks um, stay up at night trying to figure out how to avoid Google to a degree because they're fearful of what the, the, the mission can do. Hey, they're, they're worried about Apple. They should be. They should be worried about Amazon's financial services. I mean, each one of the big tech firms are building more and more, but you know what? What difference is that from PayPal? You know, what's interesting is 10 years ago when the smartphone came out, financial organizations started to get hit by new fintech players, so by new players that were doing what they did. And they pretty much walked away from the small merchant business. That merchant business meant they got fewer and fewer transactions that they were able to monitor and they were giving those things away. Even when you have a card associated with an Amazon purchase, I believe the financial service organization gets no deal detail about what they purchased. Simply that it was a, 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 an Amazon purchase. Well, what has been given away in that is my personality. Think about what Google knows about me. Think about what Amazon knows about me. Think about what Apple knows about me to the degree that they can make every engagement simpler, easier, and more personalized. I mean, I, I use the Apple card. I mean, if, if your listeners haven't opened up an Apple credit card, I suggest to do it if you can in whatever country you're in for no other reason than to see how doggone simple it is. Basically, when you apply for the credit card, the first screen is a screen that lists all the information they know about you just for a validation. So I have not pushed in one button. I go, yes, this is all right. By the way, it's almost always going to be right because you keep on updating what Apple knows about you. The second screen is last four digits of your government ID. That's four pushes. Next screen, your annual income. You put that in. The next is they say, go through the rules and the you know rules and regulations, whatever, and validate that you will approve that. During that short process, because nobody ever reads that stuff, they're processing your data on through a credit bureau, whatever your, your local credit source is. 
By the time I push that, you, the rules and regs look okay. They say, by the way, you've been approved. Now this took seconds or maybe a minute. You've been approved and the card is already in your Apple wallet. And for us legacy bankers, you know what importance that top of wallet position is. You better believe that Apple's got that whole two thirds of a, of a screen on that top of wallet. So that, that's the first option. Now, myself, I said, I'm just doing this for the test. I'm not going to use it ever. And then they said, do you want a, a metal Apple card? I said, well, what the heck? I like to see how the process ends. So I said, yes. They get back to you immediately and they say, we'll be delivering it by Federal Express in a closed envelope within three days. As you can imagine, it got there in three days. When you open up, it's a brown container, plain brown, typical Apple. You zip it, you open it up, it's got a white embossed holder. What was really interesting when you opened it, it said, authorize this card simply by putting your phone up to the card carrier. Now, what that did, it and immediately from a banker's perspective, it says, that eliminates my need to make a phone call and to push more numbers into a phone about what my account number is. They did the entire process of getting the credit, getting the card, getting it in my, my digital wallet took probably a total of maybe two and a half minutes. Our research shows that the length of time that it normally takes for a digital account opening is, is over 15 minutes in the traditional bank world because they simply turned down the branch process on a digital application, then didn't change anything. So that's, when I'm talking about the, the competition out there, that's what organizations have to be fearful of. Those organizations that understand digital engagement and the digital consumer and don't get hindered by legacy thought processes. Yeah. It's, it's interesting, right? We've, we've titled this episode with you here as, Are the Banks Dead? Long Live Banking. And, and listening to you, it almost sounds like that's correct. Do, do you agree? It's funny. My saying is we went from in 2008 too big to fail mm -hmm. to now possibly too small to succeed. And the reality is there's a little fine tune in there because we find that the smallest financial institutions, because they're small, they're re relatively agile just by the nature of who they are. And their owners really do want to change things. So getting that legacy leadership in line with what you want to do is okay. The firms that we have to be worried about um, from a survival basis, from my perspective, are these mid-sized organizations. Those ones in the mid-tier, the, the lower than the, uh, the, the, the top 10 and, and higher than $10 billion. Because they are really, they're filled with legacy bankers that have legacy thinking that to really change into a, I use embrace change, take risk and disrupt yourself. Those are all uncomfortable positions for a legacy banker. And then you see, you know, the trend now in the U S at least, and it's going to be elsewhere is you see combination of two or three mid-size traditional financial institutions. I'm going, okay, why do I think that I'm going back in my past where you combine three not optimal financial institutions and hope to come up with one really optimal financial institution. There may be cost savings, but it's the mindset, it's the culture change. And that's at the, the root of the, the challenge. And by the way, this whole can the mid-size organization succeed is also what we're seeing in the FinTech space. You know, we've seen in the last nine months, there has been no lack of investment in FinTechs, but those have been like what I'll call legacy fintechs that have been in place for quite some time that are successful they're good size the smaller ones are not getting funding and these are organizations that not build their 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 overall organization around profitability they build it around the next funding episode and so there was you know that's why monzo has done so well that's why starling has done so well is that they really built it around making sure we have some profitability that's why, you know, in, uh, in Russia as well, and in certainly the Chinese uh, fintech firms, the big ones, they've done well because they, they position it, we need to make earnings first and foremost and, and make it so we're not relying on the funding. Hmm. Actually, I mean, some people are, are saying that now is the time for the incumbents to sort of strike back. And we're seeing a, a major push by many of the incumbent banks into contextual banking. Uh, witness, uh, for example, the success of, of Yorno. 
this has banks working in collaboration with the fintechs, like you were saying, making them the engine for innovation, I suppose you could say. What's your view of, of this trend? And where do you think we will see this basically going, going forwards? If traditional banks don't take some of the best of the fintech solutions and either partner to provide them or provide them by building them internally, which is not my belief that they should be doing, People will build their own open banking solution. We're already seeing this. I mean, I, in my case, I use PayPal for my business for both receipts as well as disbursements. In fact, all the transactions on my business account are done through PayPal. What happens is I have a traditional bank that still holds money, but they know nothing about my business. That's, that's been, by the way, that's been their choice, not mine. What has happened on the other hand, though, is PayPal continues to offer me um, funding solutions, either a bridge loan or a small business loan, pre-approved. Why? Because they understand my business. Now, if I needed money, where am I going to go? Am I going to go to my legacy financial institution that may take three to five days and, oh, by the way, may not approve me? Or if I have a short-term need, am I going to go to PayPal who may charge me more? That's not guaranteed, but may charge me more. But I'm only talking about a small short-term thing. And in, in a digital world, Speed matters. Simplicity matters. Matters. So knowing that I'm pre-approved, knowing that I can get the funds immediately, and knowing that they know me drives me that way. On the other hand, I have Acorns, which is an automated savings plan that is built up over the last 28 months, I guess, around the $27,000 balance simply by taking out funds when I had them available in certain accounts without me really realizing it's like that automatic withdrawal system. I never have had a savings in my life that was built that big and that simply with that less amount of pain. So why is my traditional financial institution not doing the same thing? Now, there are a few out there that are doing that right now. Or in the same sense, you know, the know me, understand me, and reward me aspect. My, my personal bank, I've had a relationship with for 15 years, and they're a big five bank in the U.S., they reached out to me a couple of months ago and said, by the way, can you tell us what level of balance you want us to set as your minimum that will notify you that your balance is getting low? Yeah, I just, my mind was blown. I'm thinking to myself, you know what my balance needs to be on the 1st versus the 15th versus the 10th versus the 20th versus the 27th. You know I have to have extra funds in there on the 13th of the month for my mortgage, on the 26th of the month for tuition payments. And you also know when the funds come in and out. You know what my balance all has to be on each day of the month. And I'm going to say better than I do. Don't ask me to give you something that in my mind, you or a FinTech alternative is going to know. So the challenge is, are we all not building a ring around our traditional financial institution, not asking them to do very much, but then find those solutions? You know, I, I call it, you know, building your own open banking environment that I'm finding a way to get my financial services done better than I could have ever done before. And I don't care who I do it with as long as they talk to each other. Yeah, I think those uh, services from uh, those same services from the large banks are coming. Just give them a few years to figure out the risk and compliance processes first. Uh, so just take takes a while. Uh, maybe that's oh yeah. The well, and and the challenge is for the traditional banks, they don't know they're losing relationships. They only look at the accounts. I haven't closed an account, but they've lost the relationship, especially on my business bank. I, their balances still stay about the same, but how much more is it going to take before PayPal offers a, a high-end checking account with interest rates that I go, you know what? The whole issue of do I trust the fintech goes away when you get five, eight years under your belt and you go, these guys are bigger than my bank is almost. They're, you know, their valuation's higher or on my personal account. Yeah, maybe it's a top five bank, but they haven't been stellar in their way they've treated customers. They haven't they, they've been in more trouble than any of the financial institutions in the U.S. And you go, okay, and, and oh, by the way, they don't have a branch anywhere near me. So every time I use an ATM card, I'm being charged for it. So is there an option there? And, and now we're all lazy. So I think we, the traditional banks get caught in that whole dynamic of saying, oh, but look at our account base is growing. Yeah, but is it your customer base? Is it really growing? 
Yeah, that's a totally relatable scenario. And now that we talked about the uh, the big techs and we talked about the fintechs uh, and the kind of the losing of, of the customer relationship a little bit, I think the next uh, topic that we need to talk about is one of the more interesting narratives in fintech over the past years, which is, of course, the rise of financial super apps. Now, this is mostly in China uh, based on the stories that we've read so far. So we all know the Tencent and Alibaba uh, stories. Uh, so no need to repeat those over over, over again. But we, what we haven't really seen is anything like that, like uh, in China, emerge in the US uh, or, or Europe just quite yet. But we are, of course, start, starting to see different kinds of plays to try to crack at this. I mean, we, we've not seen, of course, Facebook moving into financial services through DM and Libra. Uh, and now PayPal, which is also mentioned a couple of times already during this discussion, uh, has uh, the ambition uh, that they stated publicly to become a super app uh, for all our daily needs. Now, Jim, you also wrote about this recently. Uh, what do you think? Uh, why haven't we seen these super apps uh, emerge outside China? And is that about to change? Uh, well, um, I'm not sure the why. I think it's been concerned about regulatory issues and concerned about shutting down different operations. But you know, I, I think that from the, again, I, I was lucky enough uh, a year and one month ago to go to Shenzhen and see Tencent and see Alibaba and, and visit their, their, their financial services end of things. And it was amazing because them and, and even, um, you know, some of the other big financial firms in China, their real advantage is not the platform as much as the data. They know everything about the consumer because if you understand their buying behavior or you understand how they use their mobile device, you learn a lot. I mean, there's, there's a, a company, WeBank in, in China, much smaller than the others, but was the first one to get a FinTech license in Hong Kong. The benefit of WeBank is they're doing a lot of small business loans or small consumer loans based totally, or the foundation of which is is what you do on your mobile device. And when you buy a new mobile device, they provide the financing. Now, what do these big organizations have in, have in common? They're all able to expand tremendously the potential customer base because they're all evaluating the consumer using multiple points of data. So I may not have a credit bureau because I live in an apartment, but I've paid utility bills for the last 10 years. I've had a bank account for the last 20 years, and I've been paying my, more, my rent on time. Well, those kind of dynamics or simply the way I use my mobile device takes risk out of the equation. Has it, is it a new mobile device? Was it a disposable mobile device? All these different elements from these kind of transactions, this kind of data, the Chinese organizations have built a much deeper customer relationship with people that were not bankable in the traditional sense in the US or the, the, in Europe. So who are the threats? Certainly Amazon, because, you know, who do you know that's not an Amazon Prime customer? And you talk about loyalty. I, when I used to do uh, big events, I would ask people in the audience, how many of you have an Amazon a Prime account? And virtually everybody raised their hand. I said about two and a half years ago, now it's three years ago, Amazon Prime raised their cost by about 25%. How many of you considered leaving? And you see about 5%, maybe a little bit less, raise your hand. I said, how many of you left? Everybody puts their hand down. So overall, Amazon Prime has the entire marketplace, 80, 70%, 80%, you put the number where you want. But what's interesting about that is that's loyalty. Because what are we using with our, what do we do every year our Amazon Prime account comes up for renewal? We say yes. What we're paying for is not free shipping, which is probably how many of us signed up for it because every big box store and most small boxes provide you free shipping. What you're paying for is for them just knowing you. In fact, I'm paying $125 a year to shop digitally. Okay, so if you had told me that I would pay $125 to shop digitally, you'd say you're out of your mind. Well, this is the new wave of what's going on. If you were to say that I would put my daughter in an a car driven by a complete stranger after she's been drinking at night and after she, you know anything could happen you'd say that's insane oh guess what that's uber you you force your ch children i force my son to take an uber if at all questioning about what the night's going to be don't take your car in fact that's what they do now 
My son comes home for the summer. They take Ubers everywhere as a group. Why? It's reliable. It's safe. So I think the platforms are going to be huge. The Googles, the Amazon, the Facebooks to a degree, certainly the PayPals. And anybody who's involved with payments gets it all driven by data. I think there's a very clear difference in how uh, these technology-driven companies or customer value-driven companies think about know your customer compared to banks. I guess uh, for banks, it's a burden. For them, it's a, it's a business model. And, and the consumer doesn't mind it. Because yeah. at the end of the day, and this is where the challenge is with banks, at the end of the day, the consumer wants you to know them. They want you to understand them, but they want an exchange of value. So if you continue to collect information, but you don't ever deploy it to say, you know me, that lowers the trust. My, my business bank that I mentioned before, they reached out to me at the beginning of the, the uh, pandemic and said, by the way, would you like to take advantage of PPP loans? It was an email direct, personalized to me saying, are you interested in PPP loans? Good first paragraph. Then they said, if you're interested, please sign up for online and mobile banking. I have both check against check against also if you are going to be doing di digital banking you may want to use mobile deposit capture i do it at least two times a month or you can use our atms i use them frequently you know every time they mentioned something it showed that the only level of personalization was my name at the top and there was no personalization after that which you don't see that with apple you don't see that with uber I mean, I, it was interesting. I started using Uber Eats. Uh, we, we unfortunately had a household that was uh, uh, quarantined and we took advantage of all kinds of services we hadn't taken advantage of before. And the Uber experience is one that says, you know, if they can continue to expand with their Uber Eats and Uber delivery of food and their Uber that I don't use as much now, obviously, because I'm not traveling, the travel thing, what, why wouldn't I use them for other services? And they know a lot about me as well. Perfect. Uh, now, to just to kind of wrap things up a little bit here, uh, I do need to ask about the uh, the geographical differences between uh, the US and the European fintech scene, because of course, me and Paula, we're both based in Finland, and we're mostly dealing with European fintechs for, for obvious reasons. Yep. And of course, you as a US based fintech influencer like you are, we need to ask and uh, and tell our listeners as well that how does the U.S. fintech scene differ uh, from the European or even Chinese peers? And obviously, um, is it true yeah, that yeah. everything is bigger on that side of the Atlantic? You know what? It's interesting. Um, a lot of it has to do with regulation. Uh, the U.S. still doesn't have open banking regulations, but um, as I mentioned, you can work around that in in not the definition of what you're doing, but in the way you're doing it. We we met with a very large organization, financial organization in the U.S a year and a half ago. And they point blank said, we don't look for permission every time. We try to stay within regulations and, and beg for forgiveness if we've messed up somewhere. But this that would normally be fearful of things. But when you think about it, that's the only way you can go forward because you even talk about buy now, pay later. Okay, there aren't really strong regulations around that yet. And, and in fact, the government doesn't even understand all the dynamics of the ways that regulations may be needed. Do I need it on fees? Do I need it on distribution of uh, things? Do I need it simply to protect the consumer from themselves? That gets into some really sticky stuff, but open banking has been in the UK for two years and we still don't have any open banking regulation in the US. I don't know if that puts us ahead or behind, but the regulars are just catching up. Now they're really try trying to catch up very quickly on cryptocurrencies. I think the biggest difference is, is truly in the regulatory aspect of everything. Plus, you have some major consumer differences. I mean, in Finland, you know, I don't have to talk about cashless, you know, because basically you're cashless. Yep. And, and the reality is those dynamics overall are changing every day. The difference, you know, the biggest difference, I think, between China and the rest of the world is their use and application of data. Um, the, it's, it scares me because not only is it in the way they deliver and the services they provide, but the scope of what's going on. I saw a HEMA market, which is these little markets that basically people buy all their groceries daily, digitally for delivery within 20 minutes and it's fresh and it, you can have it delivered warm and it, it's great stuff, but it's all done through Alibaba. 
And these things are distributed all around, but some of you can actually walk in. We were able to walk in and see the conveyor belts going in, people actually picking fish out of the tank and cutting them up for fresh sushi. And you go, you can't get much fresher than that. And it's from the market. So that's, by the way, that's Amazon in the US with the grocery stores. So we have all these different elements playing at the same time. So I, I think we keep on jockeying on we, Australia. We thought we were really interested in some of the fintechs there in, in the last uh, couple of months. I think two, maybe three fintech, major fintechs were purchased by legacy finance institutions. You don't know if that's to put them out of business or to deploy their solutions. But the reality is, I think we're looking at a dynamic where as far as fintech space, it's good everywhere. We, we continue to kid between the, the European uh, countries and UK with the United States and where's the fintech capital? You know, it doesn't really matter. It, it's, it's, you know, and do you really define fintech the same way anymore? Is PayPal fintech? I don't think so. You know, it, is, is Chime a fintech? Maybe still, you know, but it, the definition of what the differences are and what, how you define them, you know, and, and, and then you look at some of the big banks like Chase that built a separate fintech unit, then closed it down. Maybe they closed it down because they have 50, well, they used to have 57 stories of branch-based bankers that were threatened by you know the the child eating the parent you know gobbling up the parent the reality is it's all the same stuff right now and you better solve the consumer's need because you know i'm not using my wallet ever anymore i i take a card with me and put it in my car if i ever need it but i'm picking vendors and and merchants that all i have to use is my mobile payment why it's more secure and it's easier and most people right now with the pandemic all they're looking for it's fast and easy because they have so many different things. You know, many of them are teaching one or multiple kids at their house. They have two people working out of the house instead of no people working in the house. You know, how do you, how do you deal with that? You got to make your life easier. Absolutely. Absolutely. And, and, and actually my friends, uh, fantastic discussions. Time is flying. It, it's time for us to, to shift gears a little bit and round off to the last segment in our show uh, same, same, but different. And recently we've seen some large companies take a positive position, I would say, on crypto and Bitcoin. We discussed in the last episode, actually, the move by Tesla in uh, basically taking up uh, Bitcoin or, or buying Bitcoin on an ongoing basis. And following this trend, MasterCard recently announced that it will start to support crypto payments on its, uh, its network. I find it a real interesting move, and it sort of proves the, the, the mainstream growth and adoption of cryptocurrencies. I'm wondering, what, what are your thoughts here, Jim? Have you ever bought anything by crypt with crypto? Um, no. I've got some, ever, but I've not you ever, bought anything. Have, have you ever wanted to? Nope. No, I okay. see it as an investment uh, um, or, or a, a, specul a speculation. You know, I think yeah, exactly. You know, I take the same perspective that I'm going, OK, we can get a position where you can actually I don't have any problem with the financial institutions saying we'll, we'll provide you a holding tank for your crypto. But we're not going to manage trades or anything like that. It's, it simply can be a place where you store it. And that's fine. The reality is I, I still do not see the viability as long as it's this um, you know, shifting in, in pricing on a regular basis. I can't see it as a, a currency per se, because if, if I want to pay you and I'm, I'm paying you in funds that that have all of a sudden made it so I double paid you because the the value of the crypto or let's see what it'd be. Yeah, I double paid you because the value of crypto has gone way up or, or other way around, way down. I don't think it'd be a valid currency. And Tesla, you know, see what they did. They, yeah, you're right. They, they took a large position in crypto. And in the last month, their stock's taken a hit because consumers are worried about the fact that they have a very small percentage of their cash, but they haven't put in, in crypto. Now, mind you, it's been a great investment for the last uh, month because their investment in it helped to spur the, the marketplace, but it's gone down, I think, 20% in the last week. So, man, I, I, mind you, I would have loved to have been on the front end. I have a very small position in F. Um, but the bottom line is I, I don't see it as being anything other than maybe having the ability to, to hold a, hold a consumer's crypto in a separate entity, a separate part of the bank account. 
What, what, what do you think, Villa? Well, it's one of those cases again when it depends on who you are and whether you're holding Bitcoin or not. And, and that depends, that will tell you how the people will read this headline. Because if I'm a Bitcoin advocate and a crypto advocate, uh, I will read this headline, uh, not read the story, just the headline, uh, and figure out that, hey, finally Bitcoin is mainstream and now can I, I can use my MasterCard to pay with Bitcoin and everything will be better. Now, if you actually then read what MasterCard is saying in this, in this article, they are really talking about CDB, uh, CBDC, so central bank digital currencies, stable coins, and they put a strong emphasis on the point uh, that these whatever crypto assets are actually being moved on the MasterCard network need to be fully compliant with the relevant regulation, including KYC, AML, uh, CTF. So all the usual acronyms that you hear the bankers say uh, when talking about uh, crypto and payments. So uh, I would then argue that, okay, even though MasterCard doesn't explicitly say that it's not going to be Bitcoin, I would then throw the question back. How would the permissionless networks or permissionless cryptocurrencies like uh, Bitcoin today comply with these requirements? And uh, perhaps there's a way for them to actually do that uh, at some point in time. Maybe there is some kind of a hybrid solution that, that will make it happen. But ultimately, I think it will boil down to Jim's point. Uh, why? Uh, wh why would I spend a speculative asset that is going to be worth $100 million uh, in the near future uh, on, on, a, on an hamburger? So, uh, so yeah, uh, it's a bit of an interesting question, and uh, I think we will need to wait for a while to get that kind of definitive answer uh, to this one. No, you're absolutely right, and like I said, interesting uh, uh, yeah. uh, things to be happening, but unfortunately, we are running out of time. We've got to the end for another fantastic episode. Jim, it has been an absolute pleasure to have you here on the show with us, but before we finish off, Villa and I would like to give you a chance to let our listeners know, how can they find you, uh, get in touch? I already mentioned you've got an Instagram account, but how else can they find you? Well, you, you know, it's funny. It, it, it's not the hardest thing in the world. Um, it's one of those things that, uh, you know, people say, well, why are you a top five fintech influencer? Well, it's because I write all the time. It's not that I've done anything influential. It's not like people look to me for the guidance to the world, but I think part of the, the reality is I got on both the, uh, uh, Twitter and Insta, Insta, uh, Twitter and Facebook uh, over 10 years ago, in I think it was 2009, and at the beginning of those things, and so I've had a lot of followers over the time, and so it's not hard to meet, reach me on on Twitter. Uh, it's not very hard. You can find me on uh, obviously LinkedIn. You can find me on Instagram, as you said, but even easier is uh, you know go to the financial brand, read one of my articles. I have a link at the bottom to how to reach me. Um, it's not very hard. And, and, and from a banker's perspective, all your the listeners who may be bankers, you know, I mentioned to you earlier in our discussion that yeah, I'm trying to pay it backwards is I really want to help banks of all sizes to be able to be more competitive in the future. I'm a banker by legacy and throughout my whole career. And I believe in the industry. I love the industry. It's, it's been very good to me. So if you ever have something you want to run by me, um, I really encourage people to reach out to me on my email address is jmaroos, M-A-R-O-U-S, at thefinancialbrand.com. I will get back to you. It's the easiest way to get back to you. Or if you find my phone number, you can always uh, text me because that really gets a quick response. Fantastic. Thank you again for coming on the show and sharing some great experiences and insights with us uh, here today. It's, it's been fantastic and a great, great discussion. But most importantly, thank you, our dear listeners, for hanging out with us for yet another fantastic episode of Fintech Daydreaming. Now, do you have a fintech subject you would like to cover in a future episode? Or maybe have a, a great story to share and would like to join us as a guest on a future episode? Or even better, do you have a good but bad joke that you think our listeners would love for the beginning segment of our show? Then please send us an email on hello at fintechdaydreaming.com or ping us on LinkedIn, Twitter, YouTube, or the Anchor FM page and get in touch. Villa and I will be back in two weeks' time with another fantastically interesting guest. So looking forward to see you all again then. This has been Fintech Daydreaming. <music>